Hi guys. Well, I have to say this is <laughs> this is my most adventurous doomsday sermon I have ever had. So this is kind of take three. So anyway, it is Monday, November fourteenth, twenty twenty-two. So I am re doing my failed doomsday sermon from yesterday and now I'm playing around with this new camera so I just found out that when filming in high def uh, I did not realize I was filming in high def the camera cuts off at uh, 26 minutes I think what I've done is taken it from high def into regular recording so, uh, you guys are so lucky. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to play around with this just to, you know, to see about the video quality and the, as important, the upload times. I'm thinking that high def part one is going to take about three days to upload. So anyway... We're going to play around with my new toy, and once again, I want to send a huge thank you out to kind-hearted uh, listener Fred Baker for sending me this fine new camera, which I have to learn how to use. So, uh, I had about uh, five minutes left in... Uh, I was going to finish up with Beyond the Fossil Fuel Era, but I'm just going to, we're going to read a few more sections in this week's complicated doomsday sermon. This is part two of We Demand Too Much uh, by this fellow named uh, John Scales. Uh, and anyway, as I mentioned, if, if, you, if you want to, this is a 200-page book. If you want the link to it, this free ebook, just send me an email at collapsechronicles at gmail.com, and I will send you the link. So anyway, we're going to pick up right where part one left off. This is a 375-page book. And we're going to pick up at page 13 and read a few more sections to play around with this camera. So take it away. Take it away, Brother John. <clears throat> Beyond the fossil fuel era. So if you want to find out what was said in the first 25 minutes, uh, go listen to part one of this video. An analysis of the global ratio of population to cropland shows that we have probably already exceeded the sustainable limit of population through our dependence on petroleum. Do you think so? Much of our present agricultural output depends on their use, meaning the use of fossil fuels, but their production is expensive in terms of energy. Also, petroleum fuels have re ha petroleum fuels have replaced fuel wood and other fuels derived from biomass. The reverse transition from fossil fuels back to renewable energy sources will require a considerable diversion of land from food production to energy production. For example, 1.1 hectares, that's about three acres of land, are needed to grow the sugar cane required for each alcohol-driven Brazilian automobile. This figure may be compared with the steadily falling average area of cropland available to each person in the world. It stood at a quarter acre in 1950 and it dropped by a third in 1982. And it would be nice if he told us where it was today. Thus, there is a danger, a danger that just as global population reaches the unprecedented level of 10 billion 
or more, or maybe when it reaches 8 billion tomorrow, the agricultural base for supporting it may suddenly collapse. Ecological catastrophe possibly compounded by war and other disorders could produce famine and death on a scale unprecedented in history, a disaster of unimaginable proportions involving billions rather than millions of people. So that's where I was going to wrap up the uh, this ill-fated doomsday sermon, but uh, we're just going to plow ahead while I figure out this camera. So, what would Malthus say today? What would Malthus tell us if he were alive today? Certainly, he would say that we have reached a period of human history where it is vital to stabilize the world's population if catastrophic environmental degradation and famine are to be avoided. He would, well, I don't know if he would or not, according to John, Malthus probably would applaud efforts to reduce suffering by eliminating poverty, widespread disease, and war. Uh, I, I, have you seen many efforts to reduce suffering by eliminating war on this planet? Huh. But he would point out that since it is necessary to stop the rapid increase of human numbers, it follows that whenever the checks to population growth are removed, it is absolutely necessary to, pro to replace them by preventive checks. Malthus's point of view became more broad in successive editions of his essay, and if he were alive today, he would probably agree that family planning is the most humane of the preventive checks. He doesn't go into anything on the, the less humane preventive checks like, you know, putting it in the chemtrails and in the public water supply and in the GMOs. Anyway, in most of the societies in which Malthus described, a clear causal link can be seen and not only between population pressure and poverty, but also between population pressure and war. As one reads his essay, it becomes clear why both of these terrible sources of human anguish saturate so much of history and why efforts to eradicate them have so often met with failure. The only possible way the only possible way to eliminate poverty and war is to reduce the pressure of population by preventive checks. Since the increased food supply produced by occasional cultural advances occasional cultural advances. Can you say uh, nitrogen fertilizers? Can you say the green revolution? Can you say GMOs? Uh, those occasional cultural advances can give only very temporary relief. Today, the links between population pressure, poverty, and war are even more pronounced than they were in the past because the growth of human population has brought us to the absolute limits imposed by ecological constraints. Furthermore, 
the development of nuclear weapons has made war prohibitively dangerous. So how many people can the Earth support in comfort uh, with a margarita in every glass? The resources of the Earth and the techniques of modern science can support a global population of moderate size in comfort and security, but the optimum size is undoubtedly smaller than the world's present population. Given a sufficiently small population, and of course he does not say the magic number, what he thinks that is, Given a sufficiently small global population, renewable sources of energy can be found to replace disappearing fossil fuels. So, as I said in the first part of this, a uh, little bit of a spoiler alert that uh, John is uh, still, for some reason, uh, he sounds like a big believer in the bright green lies. Uh, of the renewable energy transition. He has not gotten the email that these renewable energy ideas are pretty much as bad as fossil fuels. It's just trading one set of problems for a whole nother, perhaps bigger set of problems. It's called unintended consequences, uh, but at least he's acknowledging here as I have acknowledged many times, that the renewable energy transition would work on a planet with a fraction of the people uh, dependent on global industrial uh, agriculture and fossil fuels. That in a world without fossil fuels, as we proved for uh, what a couple of million years, uh, that a small global population—I would say under 500 million—to quote the now defunct Georgia Guidestones, with a global population of 500 million all of these uh, renewable energy bright green lies might actually work, but there is no way in hell that it's that we're going to support uh, 8 billion people uh, without fossils. Ain't going to happen. Uh, ain't going to happen. Cannot be done. Anyway, I'm getting off on my own sermon. Uh, all right, Tech <coughs> technology may be able to find renewable substitutes for many disappearing mineral resources for a global population of a <coughs> moderate size. He is not going to give a number, obviously. What? He will not give his definition of a moderate size. What technology cannot do, however, is to give a global population of 10 billion people, or I would say 8 billion people, the standard of living which the industrialized countries enjoy today. And, uh, I need, let's go check my camera to see what it's doing. It says it's still recording here. Uh, so we're going to plow on. All right. In the distant future, the finite carrying capacity of the global environment will impose limits on the amount of resource using and waste generating economic activity that it will be possible for the world to sustain. The consumption of goods per capita will be equal to this limited total economic activity 
divided by the number of people alive at that time, whatever that bit number will be. Thus, our descendants, assuming we have descendants, will have to choose whether they want to be very numerous and very poor, or less numerous and more comfortable, or very few and very rich. Can you say, you know, the New World Order conspiracy wacko uh, argument? <clears throat> Perhaps the middle way, the middle way, yes, which is less numerous and more comfortable, may well prove to be the best. Given the fact, given the fact that environmental carrying capacity will limit the sustainable level of resource using economic activity to a fixed amount, average wealth in the distant future will be approximately inversely proportional to population over a certain range of population values. Obviously, if the number of people is reduced to such an extent that it approaches zero, the average wealth will not approach infinity since a certain level of population is needed to maintain a modern economy. However, however, if the global population becomes extremely large, the average wealth will indeed approach zero. And then he goes into a discussion on Paul Ehrlich's IPAT equation, uh, which we're not going to get into here. But um, anyway, we're going. I'm going to read one more section just to uh, play around with this camera. I could not help but think of. Uh, my fellow Doomer, Andy the Gardener, when reading this section. And we're going to close out uh, with this chapterette titled, Human Society as a Superorganism with the Global Economy as its Digestive System. A completely isolated human being would find it as difficult to survive for a long period of time as would an isolated ant or bee or termite. Therefore, it seems correct to regard human society as a superorganism. In the case of humans, the analog of the social insect's nest is the enormous and complex material structure of civilization. It is, in fact, what we call the human economy. It consists of functioning factories, farms, homes, transportation links, water supplies, electrical networks, computer networks, and much more. Um, the economy associated with the human superorganism eats resources, can you say planet eating? The economy associated with the human planet eating superorganism eats resources and free energy. It uses these inputs to produce local order and finally excretes them as heat and waste. Oh. The process is closely analogous to food passing through the alimentary canal of an individual organism. 
the free energy and resources that are the inputs of our economy drive it just as food drives the processes of our body, but in both cases, waste products are finely excreted in a degraded form. Almost all of the free energy that drives the human economy came originally from the sun's radiation. <clears throat> um, however, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, our economy has been using the solar energy stored as stored in fossil fuels. These fossil fuels were formed over a period of several hundred million years. We are using them during a few hundred years, i.e. at a rate approximately a million times the rate at which they were formed. The present rate of consumption of fossil fuels is more than 14 terawatts, whatever that means, and if used at the present rate, fossil fuels would last less than a century. However, because of the very serious threats posed by climate change, human society would be well advised to stop the consumption of coal, oil, and natural gas within the next two decades, which would, of course, mean that half the population of the planet would starve during, you know, by the end of the first growing season because the global agricultural industrial system is 100% dependent on fossil fuels. We talked about this in the first half. Yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> the rate of growth of new renewable energy sources is increasing rapidly. These sources include small hydro modern biomass. I don't know what the difference is between a modern tree and, a, and, a, and an ancient tree. Anyway, uh, modern biomass, solar, wind, geothermal, wave, and tidal energy. There is an urgent need for governments to set high taxes on fossil fuel consumption and to shift subsidies from the petroleum and nuclear industries to renewables. These changes in economic policy are needed to make the prices of renewables more competitive, so you know, he, so he's moving in to uh, you know cheerleading the bright green lights of renewables after stating a few minutes ago that he fully understands that renewable energy will not be able to support a, a population anywhere close to the population being supported by fossil fuels. So you tell me what he's after here. The shock, the shock to the global economy that will be caused by the end of the fossil fuel era will be compounded by the scarcity of other non-renewable sources such as metals, you know, can you say lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper, all of this stuff we need for the renew all of these non-renewable metals, not to mention fossil fuels that are 100% necessary to produce the renewable energy revolution. Yes. While it is true, as neoclassical economists emphasize, that matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Free energy can be degraded into heat and concentrated deposits of minerals can be dispersed. Both 
the degradation of free energy into heat and the dispersal of minerals involve increases of entropy. And then he goes on a big uh, rant about entropy. And uh... But anyway, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here. But this goes on for another 350 pages. And uh, I guess it's okay. I'm, I'm not quite ready just to publish this link, but if you want me to send you the uh, link to this excellent, at least the first half, uh, you know, I stopped reading when he got into the bright green lies. But, I mean, this is good stuff. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to figure out how this planet works or doesn't work, uh, one more time, I've already forgotten... Uh, I've already forgotten the name of the book. Uh, we are demanding too much. Oh, I keep calling him John Scales. John Scales Avery. John Scales Avery. I'm sorry if I got about forgetting your last name, brother. Uh, anyway, let's see if my camera is still recording and did I finally make it through uh, this week's Doomsday Sermon and three tries. All right. It is still recording and I see that I have now got the battery light flashing. So Sancho Panza, are you thrilled to finally be at the end of the Doomsday Sermon? from hell.